Physician Advocate for Hip Resurfacing Surgery. Today is Saturday, March 8, 2008, and I'm in San Francisco, California at the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons Conference. I have with me here today Dr. Gross from Midland Orthopedics of South Carolina. Hi, Dr. Gross, and welcome to the interview. Hello. How are you doing today? I'm great. How are you great. doing? Great. Welcome. First, uh, I'd like to start off with uh, finding out a little bit about your background, how long you've been doing resurfacing, and how long you've been doing hips in general. Yes, um, I've, I was trained at Johns Hopkins in my residency and, and, uh, and medical school, and then I spent a year in fellowship training in joint replacement in Sacramento. And then uh, I've been in, in practice in Columbia, South Carolina now for about 15 years. And uh, so I'm a specialist in joint replacement. That's how I started. And about nine years ago, I got interested in hip resurfacing. That was about 1999. That's when I did my first hip resurfacing. And what device do you use? I use the Biomet device. Um, I've been using that for three years. I'm the designing surgeon for that device. And um, uh, before that, I used the Corin device, and I ran the FDA study, multi-center center study in the U.S. Uh, for Corin. And what surgical approach do you use, anterior lateral or posterior lateral? I've used a number of different approaches for hip resurfacing, um, and I've settled on the posterior approach. That's what I, how I do all my surgeries now, and the majority of the surgeries that I've done uh, in my career have been through a posterior approach. Now, how many hip resurfacings have you done? I mean, you, you've done quite a few compared to most of the doctors in the U.S. because you've been doing this for so long. Right. I got involved in it very early. At, at the time I was doing it, I didn't think anybody else was doing metal metal resurfacing, but I found out later um, Harlan Amstutz was actually already doing metal metal resurfacing. He has a long history of resurfacing in general. Um, and uh, so I started in 1999, and I was involved in the early studies before the implants were readily available. Um, to date, I've done uh, 1,350 approximately metal metal hip resurfacings. And you use a cementless device too on occasion, right? I do. That's that's one of the one of my main interests is is uh, uh, getting rid of the cement and and using uncemented fixation for both components. So let me explain that a little bit. Um, this is certainly something that's very new to hip resurfacing, but it's not new to hip replacement and joint replacement in general. There are two ways implants can be attached to bone. Uh, one of them is by attaching the implant with cement, and the other is uh, by attaching the implant um, initially by pressing it into the bone and then having a rough coating on, on the implant where the bone can grow into. So that's called uncemented fixation. Um, the, the direct ingrowth of the bone to the implant then holds it for the long term. Um, the standard for hip resurfacing is to have an uncemented socket and to have a cemented femoral component. Uh, however, I've been working for at least five years in developing an uncemented femoral component, and uh, uh, we, we finally were able to, to uh, um, uh, complete the development about a year ago, and I started implanting these. Um, it's the first one being used in the U.S. Uh, there is one other device being used in England that's uncemented. Um, at this point, it's much too early to tell if it's going to be an improvement or if it's going to be neutral or perhaps worse than the cemented fixation. We're in the very early stages of this. So I've been using it for about a year now, and it will be at least two years before we can really say if it's going to be equivalent or, or better than a, in a, an, a, a cemented version. Now, the FDA approval of the first device came on May 9, 2006, for the BHR. Can you explain how you're able to use other devices? Yes. Before that, um, the only uh, other way you could use another device is by being involved in one of the FDA studies. So when I first started, um, I worked together with Corn. I, I, I became aware of their implant being used in Europe. I, got, I, knew, I heard about some of the early results in Europe. And uh, then I sat down together with Corn, and we developed an FDA study. It, uh, I was the f first surgeon to start that study and implant it. And then um, it, it became a multi-center study. Other surgeons signed up. And, and so that's how we got implants first before there were any approved. And then Birmingham was the first approved. And that was an implant that has been used in England for quite a while. Corn was, was actually the first worldwide, and then, uh, then the uh, Birmingham. And uh, their, their implant was approved uh, based on English data by a single developing surgeon, and the FDA looked at that and then gave them approval in the U.S. At the same time, we were running the FDA IDE study, multi-center study in the U.S. for Corin, and now that's been approved. That, that study uh, concluded last year, and we gained approval for the Corin device. So those, ha those two have, have uh, FDA approval as a total hip resurfacing device. 
Now, there are a number of other devices in this country, including the Biomet one that I use, um, the Pew, Wright Medical, and I believe Zimmer, Zimmer, which have approval for their implants, but they don't have approval for the indication of total resurfacing. And, and that's a little bit confusing. And perhaps I should explain that. Um, the FDA doesn't regulate surgeons' practice. They regulate how implant companies can sell their devices or what they can even sell. So um, if you have an implant approved for use, like there, there are now six companies, to my knowledge, that have implants approved for use in the U.S., but they're not approved for total hip resurfacing. So if a surgeon purchases those implants or a hospital purchases those implants for the surgeon to put in, it would be called an off-label use. That's perfectly legal. It's done all the time, um, but, but the company cannot market it to the public. They can't market it to surgeons. Surgeons just have to know about it and, and choose to use it that way, and that's called an off-label use. Um, if a company wants to market it, they have to have the FDA indication, and that's what uh, Birmingham and now uh, Corin, which is being marketed by Stryker, they have that, and they can now market it uh, readily. So, Dr. Gross, how successful have you been in obtaining insurance approvals for resurfacing? Um, generally, it's not a problem. Um, the, the only situations where I find it a problem is in patients who are on HMOs. And HMOs are companies that... Basic that, that usually there's there's such a variety a different variety of, of health plans in this country it's it's hard to, to generalize too much but basically an HMO sells you an insurance and you agree then to go to a very limited number of doctors that they have on their plan and if someone on that plan doesn't do hip resurfacing then you have to convince them um, that this is something really that you need and and then you, that you should go outside of the system and most HMOs in theory have a system in place so that you can, you can have something done outside of your plan. In practice, they usually find some good excuses to, to deny the services to you, and then you're, then you're stuck. So HMO, HMOs are really the, the only group, patients who have HMO coverage are really the only group that really have difficulty um, coming and hanging with surfacing unless they just chose to go outside of their plan and pay for it. But most other insurance companies, uh, it's not a problem gaining approval. You're one of the most experienced resurfacing surgeons in the U.S., so you probably have a lot of patients that come from out of town. How do you handle that? Do you have a system in place to help the patients as far as where to stay, et cetera? Oh, yeah, certainly. Um, probably about five years ago, I got my first patient, uh, call from a patient out of state, and I kind of had to start working out a way to handle this. Um, at this point, about 80% of my patients come from outside of South Carolina, um, from really all over the United States. Um, I have a website that's very detailed and gives them a lot of information. That's grossortho.com. And, um, and my staff has this all worked out, and they, you call in. And there's a detailed system, but basically you access it through the website. And for the routine patient for resurfacing, they come out to South Carolina a day before the surgery, uh, meet with me, have the surgery, and uh, uh, two or three days later they're flying back um, to their hometown, and they come back to see me in six weeks, barring any problems or complications. So what is a typical stay in the hospital for a patient? Um, my patients usually stay in the hospital um, overnight, one night if they're local patients and two nights if they're out-of-state patients. Um, the whole process uh, for an out-of-state patient takes uh, um, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, four to five days. So the typical scenario is, is for them to fly in on Monday, um, and then see me in the office on Tuesday, where we do all the final um, evaluation, examination, go over everything, and then have surgery on Wednesday. Um, on Friday around noon, they're discharged from the hospital. I ask them to stay one more night in the hospital if they're flying. If they're driving from not too far away, from you know, a few states away, uh, they can leave at that time if they're doing well. But um, people who are flying in from out of state, I ask them to stay one more night in the hotel so that then on Saturday they'd be flying home. And that's just in case... That just gives us a little leeway so they're not canceling flights if there's something that comes up. That's a typical stay. And what is your typical post-op um, protocol? Do you have 90-degree restriction? How long on crutches?